15 minutes, I'm going to present some of the main insights of a paper written by Hein, um, Simona, and myself on the nature and evolution of migration policies. And so basically the paper addresses two main questions. The first relates to the academic debate that we have been having these last three days on the effectiveness of migration policies, which I don't have to repeat here. But what we were more interested in this paper was not the answer to this question of effectiveness, but actually the assumption on which this debate is based, namely that migration policies have become more restrictive over time. And it's quite interesting to see if you read articles discussing the effectiveness of policies in reducing migration, that actually very few articles provide uh, really evidence for the fact that migration policies have actually attempted to do so in the first place. And this is what we um, try to do in this article, to provide rather long-term and also cross-country evidence and test whether migration policies have become more restrictive over time, and in relation to that also to look at how selection mechanisms of um, nation states have shifted. So a definition is always a good starting point, and within the DENIC project we have defined migration policies as rules enacted by states in order to influence the volume, origin, composition or direction of migration flows. But there is also another very important concept that we have used in this paper and more importantly in the database that we have been constructing, which is the concept of policy restrictiveness. And I want quickly to explain what we mean by that because we are not talking about absolute levels of migration policy restrictiveness in this paper and in the database. We are talking only about changes in restrictiveness over time. And this means that we assess for every policy change uh, whether it introduced a more or less restrictive um, change within the legal framework that was already in place before. So we coded a more restrictive change plus one and a less restrictive change minus one. And this is really crucial because it means that with our data we cannot really draw quick cross-country comparisons. So, for example, if there were five restrictive changes in country A last year and three restrictive changes in country B last year, we cannot say that country A is more restrictive than country B because it really depends on the baseline legal framework from which we have started to count. So, this is quite important to say. So, very quickly on the database that we are drawing on and which Hein already introduced uh, in his keynote very quickly, so it records 6,500 policy changes um, for uh, 45 countries uh, over the 1945-2012 period. For some countries we go back in time until the end, uh, starting at the end of the 19th century, but not, of course, for all of those countries. And um, maybe some other uh, important things to say in, trying, in, in doing this database, we try to at least partially overcome the receiving country bias in research by also integrating some non-Western countries in our data set and by tracking for every country both immigration and immigration policies. And another thing that we did, uh, especially in coding the data and which kind of also turned out to be quite important in the discussions we had at the beginning of the first day, is um, that we uh, disaggregated every um, policy reform into its different measures. And we did this because we consider that migration policies can be contradictory and are often made up of uh, such measures. So for example, one law can at the same time restrict access to refugees and open a new channel for family migrants. And so we have to disaggregate those measures in order to assess the change in restrictiveness. And in relation to that, we also specified in our coding system always the target group uh, of the specific policy measures, so whether it targets high-skilled migrants or uh, refugees or irregular migrants or whatever you want. And this, this coding system really allowed us um, to analyze changes in policy restrictiveness uh, for each target group. But let me now turn to the first question on growing restrictiveness. So you have seen this graph on the first day of the conference, but I would like to take it as a starting point for what I'm going to say. So it shows, uh, as Heinz said, average yearly changes in migration policy restrictiveness over the 20th and early 21st century. And how was this graph made? So basically we calculated for every year um, how many restrictive changes there were and how many less restrictive changes. And we made the average for all the countries together and looked at what we got. And this is what we get. And so basically a score above zero means that uh, 
um, the number of restrictive changes in that year was higher than the number of less restrictive changes. And if uh, the line is below zero, it means that less restrictive changes dominated in that year. And so if we look at the left-hand side of the graph, and that actually fits quite well with the previous presentation because we see very nicely this peak in restriction um, also in the, in the, in before the two world wars, um, which kind of confirms what we have in the literature also about this turn towards protectionism, nationalism um, before the world wars. But what you also see is that since 1945, the line has quite consistently stayed uh, below zero, and in fact there are only 10 years in which the average very slightly jumps above the zero line. And this means that all countries taken together, and we know the caveats of taking all countries taken together, we have discussed that, um, still less restrictive changes seem to dominate over the whole period. And um, this pattern is actually is also quite robust if uh, we look at the uh, patterns within each country. So of course there are a lot of variations, but still the, the pattern itself and the trend is quite robust. Um, what we also see, however, is that since the mid-90s, the line gets closer to zero, right? And this means that over the past two decades, the number of more and less restrictive changes has become more balanced. And if we now think that often uh, restrictive policy changes are more publicly discussed and are more present in public discourse, then this might also explain why we do have this impression of a growing restrictiveness, despite the fact that actually the that the, the picture on the ground in the policies on paper is rather balanced. So now let's get, get over this generic picture um, and uh, look at a bit more fine-grained trends. So what we did in, in, uh, in this database was uh, that we classified every policy measure into four policy categories, legal entry integration, um, border control, and exit policies. And so these are the different uh, lines for those four areas. And so, um, for instance, if that works, no, whatever, the top line is uh, border control, as you can see, and you see that it's consistently um, dominated by restrictive changes, while integration and legal entry policies, which are the two dotted lines at the bottom, um, have been dominated by less restrictive changes over this, this whole period. And this really contradicts the common assumption that we have about a growing restrictiveness and, and rather reflects a dual development in which states have uh, opened more regular channels for so-called desired migrants, whoever they might be, and at the same time um, use border controls in order to keep the non-desired migrants out. What is not shown in this graph is that in the last two decades um, there has been really an exponential increase in the number of border control measures and um, the conclusion is that this recent trend towards a more balanced picture that we have seen in the, in the previous graph is actually not driven by more restrictive entry policies, but rather by the higher frequency and density of border control measures in the last decades. And finally, uh, a word maybe on exit measures. You see that this is the only non-consistent pattern over time. And one interpretation might be that from the 60s to the 80s, there were quite a lot of reintegration programs and voluntary return programs at, the, at that time. They had a bit of a different quality um, that were enacted, while since the 90s there has been really a shift towards expulsion and forced return. Um, let's now look at the second question of changing selection. Um, what our analysis reveals is actually that the essence of migration policies since World War II is not really a growing restriction, but rather an increasing sophistication of policies. And this is also supported by the fact, I'm not showing the numbers here, but in our database we see that today 80% of all the policies enacted are targeting specific migrant groups, so low-skilled, high-skilled refugees, etc. While in the past, so a few decades ago, actually 40% of the policies were targeting, were generic and targeting all, all migrants. And so this points towards a process of policy sophistication, which is also driven by the creation of ever more specific migrant channels and migrant categories that, that migrants have to fit into today. And in this sense, legal migration might have become a bit more difficult in reality, despite the opening of a, a lot of new entry channels, because migrants have to fit into increasingly more specific migrant categories. So from the migrant perspective, it might be more difficult today, although the state has opened a lot of new possibilities. 
And so as migrant categories seem to play quite an important role also, as, as we have seen in the last uh, days, um, I will now zoom into the changes uh, in migration policy restrictiveness towards specific target groups. Um, and as you can see on this graph, policies on low-skilled workers, but also labor migrants more generally, this is the finely dotted line and the more broadly dotted line, um, have moved into a less restrictive direction over the whole period. And this really is quite surprising because it contradicts this generic assumption that we have that states have closed their borders to low-skilled migrants. And this is also confirmed with, by what is occurring at the country level. Um, however, we should not infer too much from this generic trend and acknowledge, of course, that next to skills, also the geographical origin is important uh, to determine how easy or not it is to migrate. And I just referred to the paper by Marie-Laurence Flau, who has talked about um, migrants from Africa, where it has actually become more difficult for them to migrate. Not so surprising for the high skill, um, of course, uh, policies have opened up and have also become increasingly popular in the past decades and have been implemented not only in Europe and North America, but also more increasingly in um, Asian countries, for instance, and that might be linked to what you just said about strategic adjustment, maybe. I'm just uh, putting this hypothesis out there, but I found that actually quite interesting. Uh, this figure um, now shows the trend for three other migrant categories, and we can see that for family migrants, while until the 80s states have really opened up possibilities for family reunification, since the 2000s, um, the relative proportion of restrictive changes has increased, although on average it's still a very balanced picture, and this reflects the introduction of higher age and income thresholds, but also of uh, these language tests and, and, and culture tests that we have seen um, uh, emerging. And perhaps surprisingly, uh, policies towards refugees also stay above zero. And we thought that this might reflect the fact that in our data set, we have quite a lot of non-Western countries. And so that despite the um, growing restrictiveness maybe in Europe and North America towards refugees, actually quite a lot of non-Western countries have only implemented international refugee protection instruments over the last decades, which might a bit drive uh, this trend. And finally, um, ir irregular migrants are really the only category that are clearly in the more restrictive line. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we all know quite a lot about that. It reflects increasing uh, border control, carrier sanctions, employer sanctions, um, and so on. But this overall uh, restrictive trend actually conceals that regularization practices have spread in European and also in Latin American countries really as a structural policy response to irregular migration. And this is not really uh, in here. So I have a bit of time to conclude, and that's nice. And I would like to emphasize uh, four points here. First of all, um, what our paper really showed also is that there is quite a limited methodological value of focusing only on overall restrictiveness. And while we obviously did that as well, um, it, is, it is maybe just a starting point, and from then on we have to go beyond that and look at more fine-grade trends, and so I have tried to show some first ones, but I think we will work mu much more on that in the future, so keep an eye on the IMI working paper series. Uh, there will be something on there, I hope. The second thing I wanted to say is that really our paper shows that migration policies have undergone some structural changes over the past decades, but that those changes do not really pertain to changes in restrictiveness, but rather to the increasing sophistication of migration policy regimes, which are more and more aimed at selection um, rather than the at regulating the selection rather than the volumes of migration. And this then um, led us to hypothesize also that there is a significant discursive gap really between this, this tough talk that we hear all the time of uh, politicians who try to attenuate fears um, or of the public about migration and the actual policies on paper that are enacted in the end. And that therefore migration policies might be really mainly about giving the appearance of control, as Douglas Massey has already suggested quite a while ago. And finally, um, a word of caution really on the limitations of our analysis and also um, and the last presentation in this session will we'll talk about that a bit more because we of course analyzed policies on paper and did not at all look at implementation but we all know that implemented policies can be more or less restrictive than what the paper suggests. And this 
opens, of course, a whole new uh, area of research which we were not able to uh, integrate in this project. But still, despite that limitation, uh, we think that it does not really undermine our central and quite robust uh, observation, also if you go into the details of this paper, that we might need to nuance this generic assumption that a lot of people have in literature that migration policies have become more specific. Thank you for your attention.